homemade traditional Peruvian dessert, alfajores, basket of ham, beef, turkey, veggie gourmet sandwiches. Call Giveaways Catering, phone number 778-245-3007. I would go for interviews and I would apply for call center executive kind of positions and I would be, the interviewer would look at my resume and say you're far too experienced. This is for me the way to start a portrait because when you are drawing the portrait, this is uh, the skull, first things you need to know is uh, about the bones. Namaste. Nepal, the country of the world's tallest peak, the Mount Everest. Pooja Ruprao became a writer here in Vancouver. Uh, her journey to begin a new life in Canada started in 2006. It took her several years. The decision to leave her country, India, did she do a big mistake or not? Pooja Rupro is our guest on our Tell Us Your Story segment. Welcome to our Dining and Magazine's program. My childhood in India was pretty colorful. Um, didn't come from a very affluent family. I grew up in a joint family, so there was my mom, my dad, my dad's brother and his family. He had four kids and my grandma, so, and all of us were all of, all of us were living in a one bedroom home. It was just two, room, two rooms. So my parents, myself, and my sister, I have an older sister, we lived, we made a room on the attic and we were living in the attic. So while it was a small home, uh, we were not very well off, but there was lots of love. Uh, my uncle had four kids. So there were six of us in the same home. It was always noisy. My dad's sister lived four houses down from us. She had four kids, mm -hmm. so there were actually 10 of us. And I was the youngest of the 10. Um, it was lots of fun, lots of cousins. Um, I, the one incident that I always remember is my grandma um, would feed us dinner and she would make all 10 of us sit in a row and she would be feeding all of us at the same time, right, one by one. And um, it was fun, growing up was lots of fun, but. Like I said, it wasn't, we didn't come from, I didn't come from a very affluent, very rich family to start with, but there was no shortage of love. Um, well, I didn't always have everything I need, for sure. Um, there was lack at home. We didn't always have lots of money. Um, there were things I wanted that I couldn't always have. But I don't think, as a child, I didn't think too much about it. It was all right. Um, I was too happy to worry about what I didn't have. Mm -hmm. I was enjoying life. I was surrounded with love. I was surrounded with family. Mm -hmm. So the first several years, I didn't experience that I was lacking something. It was only as I grew up and I started to go to college and then see other kids. And then the comparison started to creep up in my life. Mm -hmm. But as a child, I was totally happy and carefree. Mm -hmm. So the reason I decided to leave India was very, very personal. Um, when I got married, actually, this was in 1993, my husband, from one year within our, after our marriage, he wanted to move to Canada and I resisted. I didn't want to leave home. I didn't want to leave family. So I was the one who was resisting. But in about 2000, I wasn't having a very easy time in my career. Um, I was struggling in my career. Mm -hmm. I wasn't moving ahead as fast as I wanted. I wasn't surrounded by a very, I was in a very positive environment where my career was concerned. And I think it was in that year that I decided I'm going to, I'm going to finally do what my husband always wanted to do. We're going to try and move to another country. Mm -hmm. But it was only because I was experiencing um, dissatisfaction and unhappiness at my work and where I was in my career and that was the reason I decided to move. Mm -hmm. The move from Canada to India, I can say from India to Canada, sorry, has been, it's been a period of growth and learning. 
obviously have been uprooted. It's like living in two different planets. India and Canada are poles apart. So when you move from one place to another, you're forced to grow. I have no family here other than, of course, my husband and my two kids. We, just the four of us came here. So when I came, I had no family. I had no friends. So obviously, I had to grow. I had to learn to become far more independent than I ever was in India because in India, I had lots of support. I had friends. I had family. I had grown up there, so I knew lots of people. I didn't have that luxury over here. So lots of times when... There was loneliness and um, obviously I was forced to take care of myself and that forced me to grow. I always think that I've grown in Canada over the past 10 years, um, at least if I was still in India, it would have taken me at least another 25 years to have this kind of growth. Um, so it's I've learned, I've been reading a lot. I am a voracious reader, so I encouraged myself. There were times of struggle, there were times of fear. Mm -hmm. Fear played a big role. Um, you're always afraid, right? When you come to a new country, we had no jobs. We didn't have enough money, so didn't know if we could be successful. I did have, I was working in management while I was in India, but when I came here, the first job that I was able to get was in a call center with $12. and. I was a manager, I was a senior manager in India. So to make that, to start your career afresh at that age when you have so many years of experience behind you is a challenge. It hurts your ego, right? Um, so you're forced to grow, you're forced to align yourself with the environment. For the first one year, every single day. I questioned every day if we had made the right decision. Um, we had a home, we had a family, we had a car, we had maids. We had a pretty luxurious life in India. So moving here, our first home was a studio apartment. Four of us in this one room falling all over each other. So we had left our big home to come here. And of course, I didn't have a job, um, didn't have a car. I didn't have a driver's license. And we moved here in February. It was freezing. I came from a country where the temperature, I came from a city where the temperature was, if it was, 20 degrees, it was considered cold. So I came from a pretty warm climate. And when we landed, the day we landed, I remember it was minus three. Um, didn't own anything like jackets or coats. It was quite a challenge, right? The weather challenged you. The, I mean, the culture challenged you because I was not used to it. I came from an overcrowded city and here there was so much space. When I would go to work and it was so quiet, I would, almost wonder the, the quiet would scare me, the silence would scare me because it was so noisy back in India. So for the first one year, I thought at least every single day, why did I come here? And I wish I could go back. I made the biggest mistake of my life. Um, it doesn't matter which part of the world we live in, good, evil and good exists, right? Um, some human beings come from a place of negativity and that's the way they are. So I found good and evil people in India and I found good and not so good people over here as well. But I think I found, I found many, many people who were willing to help me as well. So the ones who were not willing to help me, I trained myself to ignore them. There were many people who would come to you and you know, when they, an immigrant would share a story with you, they would tell you about they are failures, right? How long it took them. And when you listen to those kind of stories, you think, oh, I've set myself up for failure. It took them seven years to become a manager. So you start to feel discouraged and you begin to think, oh, that's what your life is going to be as well. But I train myself to shut those stories out and to listen to the success stories because I wanted to succeed. Um, one of the biggest obstacles I found was with regard to my career. Um, so I would go for interviews and I would apply for call center executive kind of positions and I would be, the interviewer would look at my resume and say, you're far too experienced. Um, and so would reject me on the ground that I was far too, grounds that I was far too experienced. I would apply for management and I would be told that I don't have Canadian experience. That was a little frustrating. So I think I was very fortunate 
besides being fortunate, I was so determined that I was going to be successful here. Mm -hmm. So that helped me. But I know that this is a challenge that many of my friends as well share, right? That you don't get acknowledged for your experience in a different country mm -hmm. when you come to Canada. I found that I found that to be an obstacle for sure. I did find um, English also some of the words that I used. For example, in India, uh, when you're moving from one home to another, you say I'm shifting. So when you tell, I would tell somebody over here I'm shifting, they wouldn't get what that meant. So I would keep listening to the English news all the time mm -hmm. so that I could get the words correctly and use the right words in my conversations. Mm -hmm. So having worked here now since 2006, I don't think the fact that I did not have Canadian experience was a disadvantage. From the country where I came, um, it's far more challenging to do one's job than it is over here. Just because of the culture, the competition, it's a country of over a billion people, right? So there's a lot more competition. You have to strive harder to grow because for every position that you want, there is a huge number of people already available. Not that that's not the case in Canada, but just the number of people. It's far more challenging to work in a country like India than it is, that's my personal experience, than it is in Canada. So that statement about not having Canadian experience, in my particular profile, I didn't think it was relevant because I came from a customer management kind of profile. So that's customers are customers, right? If you have the skill to handle customers, if you know how to communicate and you have those skills, you don't necessarily need Canadian experience. Mm -hmm. No, that was only the first one year that we moved here. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we were staying, we were living in a small studio apartment. So there was four of us. And um, I wouldn't be able to sleep because I was worried, constantly worried. I was doing this $12 job to start with was unhappy about that um, and I was unhappy about where we were like four of us living in a single in one room we had been unable to unpack yet um, we were starting life from scratch right so there was a lot of fear and anxiety within me I was worried about my kids about how they would adjust would my husband get a job you know, or would I have to turn back and go and say I wasn't successful? But there was also a part of me that did want to turn back and go. Go back to the comfort zone, go back to everything that I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. And so because I couldn't sleep, I would get up and I would start chanting. I practice Buddhism, mm -hmm. so I would get up and start praying. Do you know that uh, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night is a portrait of a sounder French town? Van Gogh worked on this painting while he was a patient at a mental hospital in the town. Talking about paintings, it's time to present our painting with Miralda segment. Take a look. Hi, welcome to my segment, Painting with Miralda. Today, we are going to see uh, the beginning of portraits, how to draw portraits. Uh, here is uh, Doug Willoughby. He has a lot of experience in painting and uh, he has an architectural background and he's going to be with us. How do you Thanks, feel? Minelda. Well, we're going to uh, take a look at uh, portraits, uh, single portraits. Let me show you one example. Right here. And we're going to focus on the first one or two steps that it takes to do a realistic representative portrait. Uh, Doug said to me that this is a little bit, could be scary, but I was saying that uh, this is for me the way to start a portrait. Because when you are drawing the portrait, this is uh, the skull, first things you need to know is uh, about the bones because the, the bones is structure. yeah the underlying structure so when you have the bones here for instance you can dress the bones later and you can for instance put the eyes you know the nose the mouth the neck etc 
cetera. And then, and then you will have a face. And I'm gonna show you, what do you think about it, Jack? That one? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty good. Dressing the skull and doing first, you know, how is that, that, that the skull configurated? Because it's amazing. Let's try to do something here. First is one circle, then another circle, right? So we have two holes here, and then we have another one here, and then we have the jaw, and then we have the teeth, etc. Yeah. And then on top of this, you dress it, you put the eyes. This is not going to be perfect because I'm not seeing it. And I hope it is. And so on and so forth. But the thing is to be aware of the bones inside, you know, the skin. Why? Because we need shadows. And when we know where the bones are, then we can go along with the shadows. So to make a three-dimensional drawing. What do you think, Doug? I think that's a cute <laughs> And uh, so to do a drawing, portrait drawing is not easy. But if you follow the technique, and the technique from my point of view is to start with the skull, with the bones, and then you dress it with the muscles, and then you dress it more with the shadows, and you put the details, and then is when you can have a portrait. And uh, the most important, after all, is to loosen up, just to loosen up your, your hand, right? Just do the two circles, remember the circles, then Another two for the eyes, the nose, the jaw, and just play with it. Don't take it so seriously, don't be afraid. And, you know something? Try to copy all the faces you see around you. Hmm? For instance, that will be, <laughs> I can see, you know, he's, uh, Try to copy faces, try to draw faces all over. Your friends, your uh, family, what do you think? People you hate. <laughs> People you hate and you are drawing like this. Uh, what do you think about, you know, just to start co copying, drawing, do faces all the way. I like that idea, Miralda. I think it's important when you start drawing to do a number of projects, a number of faces, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, don't be too self-critical when you draw. Just uh, draw simply, have fun, uh, keep it loose, mm -hmm. and keep your art critic in the back. Don't listen to the art critic while you're drawing. Yeah. Uh, it will stop you dead. You won't be able to move mm -hmm. if you're criticizing yourself while you're drawing. Thank you very much for uh, being here with us. Uh, this is, you know, the end for today, and I'm expecting to see you in the next uh, segment. And thank you, Doc, for being here. And, and have a good drawing. Remember, draw. Have fun. Have fun. <laughs>
Eight of the 14 tallest mountains with a pinnacle over 8,000 meters and widely regarded as the roof of the world are in Nepal. Nepal is one of the world's prosperous countries in terms of abundant biodiversity and incredible terrain and latitudinal variation. The geographical condition varies from 8,848 meters Mount Everest to the lowland just 70 meters from the sea level in the Tarai Plains within the territory of 150 kilometers. Geographically, Nepal is divided in Himali, the mountainous, Pahari, the hilly, and Tarai, the plains. The Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal, all-time sovereign and independent country in South Asia, is home to about 29 million people. Though secular as enshrined in the constitution, majority of the Nepalese are Hindu. The number of Buddhists is also notable in Nepal, the birthplace of the light of Asia, Lord Gautama Buddha. Similarly, people with other faiths also live in Nepal. Religious harmony is one of the characteristics of this country. The natural diversity in Nepal is incredible. Nepal is a safe habitat for the rare one-horned rhino species. The country is a single home to hundreds of ethnically and culturally diverse people. In the country where there are more than 70 dialects, each community has a distinct cultural identity. Various feasts and festivals, traditional customs and lifestyles make the country a culturally prosperous one. Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, is an amalgam of historic civilization, rich tradition and modern lifestyle. A city with age-old Newar tradition and seven of the world heritage sites is now converting into a multicultural hub. Tourism is the major mainstay of Nepal's economy. To welcome the tourists and show their hospitality is the lifestyle of the Nepali people. Nepal has about a dozen television stations and about 300 radio stations making business or serving the people. Nepal Television, the pioneer and the only state-owned channel of Nepal, is producing and rendering diverse content to the people for over 26 years. Welcome to Nepal. you are going to watch were not on our script. Behind the scenes, next.
Bueno, yeah. empezar a decir, luego sigo yo, no, no, lo que quiere decir es, y podemos hacer como una... Ya, yeah, pues ahora, ya. Yeah, 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 that was... Notice how I don't say um or ah uh when I'm talking. Just, just say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bravo, Douglas. You trust that over time it will go... Like riding a bicycle. <laughs> Excellent. Because your love is unlimited. Because you are our best warrior in front of the difficulties. Because you always save our lives in different ways. Simply you. Happy Mother's Day from your Immigrants Medicine Program. Thanks for watching us. I am Fabiola Palomino, your host. Nora Valdés te ofrece orientación y la información que necesitas para iniciar tu nueva vida aquí en Canadá. Para mayor información, llame al teléfono 604-351-0625. Problemas de relaciones interpersonales, separación, divorcio, problemas con niños, adolescentes y adultos. Soy la doctora Yolanda Montoya, soy clinical counselor y mi teléfono es el 604 861 1071